There is only one good way of narrowing an axle, and this method that I'm using today is not it. Hey, fellow garage fabbers. Is that cheesy? Yeah, it's really cheesy. Fits me perfectly. It's 111 degrees in Vegas today and insanely humid for some reason. If you're just joining us, we are smack dab in the middle of completely rebuilding my wife's 1987 Mitsubishi Mighty Max. And in previous episodes, we've already converted the front hubs from the Mitsubishi six lug pattern to a five lug pattern and narrowed the front of the chassis four inches to get a very specific set of wheels to fit inside the fenders. If that sounds interesting to you, go check out episodes number one and five right now. Right now. Now that the front is done, we're moving on to the rear where we have to do technically the same thing. But in order to change the lug pattern from six to five, I'm changing out the entire axle. I've decided to take out the Mitsubishi Mighty Max axle and swap it with a 2004 Ford Mustang axle with disc brakes. Yay! This is gonna give me the lug pattern I'm looking for, but the Mustang axle is way wider than the Mighty Max axle. So we're technically gonna have to do the same thing as we did with the front and narrow it so that these wheels will tuck inside the bedsides. But because many of my beautiful subscribers are Mitsubishi Mighty Max and L200 and D50 owners, even though I'm not going to use the factory axle, it has some differences from the Ford Mustang axle, so I'm going to narrow that one as well, just for the video. Before I start, I want to point out that there is only one good way of narrowing an axle, and this method that I'm using today is not it. My goal with this video is to give you the best options and attempt to steer you away from the truly terrible options, all while showing you how to do what I think is barely an acceptable option. For Ford and a few other commonly used axles, there's an internal jig available, which consists of machined components that fit tightly at the inner and outer ends of the axle housing and a precision steel rod that fits through them. The entire purpose of this jig is to keep all the bearings in line while welding, even if the housing isn't perfect. Even a slightly bent axle can be successfully shortened with this type of jig. An external jig, like the one I'm about to make, assumes that the axle housing is perfect, and there is no way to guarantee the alignment of the bearings. Any misalignment of the bearings will cause them to fail prematurely. It's not uncommon that an axle housing will bend slightly over time, and using an external jig to shorten it would be questionable, at best. So if I know this, why am I still choosing this method? Well, here's the main reason. I will certainly be shelling out the cash for a proper jig if a client asks me to professionally narrow their axle, but until then, now is my time to experiment and learn. There are several differences between the Mighty Max and the Mustang axles, but right now I want to focus on how the inner axles are held into the axle housing. On the Mustang, the differential needs to be partially disassembled so that you can remove a C-clip from the inner end of the axle shaft, and out it comes. Seriously, that is all that's holding your back wheels on. Don't worry, your Mustang will crash itself into a crowd long before you break one of these clips. The Mighty Max axle shaft, on the other hand, is held in by four nuts at the end of the axle housing. Remove these nuts and the axle will slide out of the housing with the bearings and brakes still attached. Set the shafts aside and we'll discuss shortening them later on. The total width of the jig will be based on the finished axle width. The factory Mustang axle measures 55 inches between the end plates and I intend to remove 10 inches total, which means the cradle of the jig will need to be 45 inches or less to sit in between the axle's end plates, but not much less. Because the more cradle that contacts the axle tube, the more accurate it will be. And as mentioned, this method is already not as accurate as we'd like it to be, so it's important our jig is flawless, so we get the best results possible. 
I'm going to start with a sturdy base using that measurement. I'm using two and a half inch square quarter wall steel. There's almost no such thing as overkill on the base because this thing absolutely cannot flex. The center of the cradle will be removed to make room for the 16 inch wide differential, hopefully leaving two separate cradles that are perfectly in line with each other. Each side is going to have two upright supports. One support on each side is more than enough to support the axle, but adding more uprights will help minimize the amount of movement caused by warpage while welding. The outer two supports will be welded to the base just shy of the axles finished width mentioned before, and the inner supports just over the width of the differential. Each support gets a V-cut at the top for the angle iron cradle to rest in. Take your time welding and move around a lot and evenly to keep warpage under control. We're not building a bridge, so many tack welds will do just fine. Check the cradle often with a straight edge as you go. Straightness is much more important than strength on this one. So have patience and go slow. Oh my God, what are you doing? What did I just say? What did I just say? Ow. The axle stand slash jig is nearly complete. All that's left is to cut out the center section to make room for the differential. And that's gonna be the moment of truth to find out if this thing is as perfectly straight as we need it to be. Because when I make that cut, hopefully nothing is gonna happen. But because I was rushing when I was welding, there's a good possibility the two pieces are going to spring together on the blade, spring apart or spring left and right. And we don't want that. We want this to remain completely straight even though the center section is removed. But right now, it is so hot, I can barely touch it. So I'm gonna let it completely cool so that the metal can completely relax. And then I'm gonna come back and make the cut and see how I did. Well, I gotta go and get my truck smogged and I think it's about the perfect amount of time to let this thing cool. So I'm gonna go do that, come back, and we'll cut this thing apart. Oh man, the feeling of passing a smog test with half an exhaust is is, is a mystery to me. I, I wouldn't know since I have all the uh, things. Well, it's definitely not perfect. When cutting through the angle iron right at the end of the cut, everything sprung in and it clamped down on the blade. Uh, I almost lost my face. I definitely lost the blade. The blade is toast. Um, but all in all, it's, it's, it's close. It's close. It seemed to just clamp inwards a little bit, but the vertical alignment and the left and right alignment of the two pieces of angle iron are Ah, man, it's close. I'd say it's like a 32nd of an inch off on one side, which is really weird. Almost as if the angle iron itself was under tension and it, and it sprung open. I don't know. It's really weird. Uh, but I'm going to run it. Hopefully we're not cooking bearings once every oil change. I guess I'm going to have to report back to you on that one. Correction. With a strange configuration of ratchet straps and pry bars, I managed to flex the jig slightly to bring both sides into perfect alignment. Certainly not a glamorous calibration, but I'm very pleased with the straightness now. Let's remove the center of the jig and start on the axle. Because the accuracy of this project is completely dependent on the outside of the axle housing, the tube needs to be free of any protrusions and imperfections. The old mounting brackets need to be removed and the welds ground flat. Minor dents and dings shouldn't have an effect 
but anything sticking up will. That includes dirt buildup and even tiny bits of weld spatter from the factory welds. After cleaning, I found that the edges of the vent hole weren't flush, as well as some other imperfections, possibly from road debris. So I knocked it all down with emery cloth. Feel the tube with your bare hand, and if you feel something sticking up, knock it down. Absolutely anything that can hold the axle up will negatively affect the straightness. It's time to start making some marks and cut the housing apart. Here's my method of getting a perfectly perpendicular cut, even with a handheld cutoff wheel. I bought a few of these $4 flexible plastic three ring binders from Office Depot. I use the material for templates that get a lot of repeated use or for tasks that require flexing that cardstock can't handle. The bonus here is the binder has perfectly machine cut edges. If you wrap the plastic tightly around the tube and line up the edges, you can mark a perfect cut line. I also use the same material for perfect tubing notches without a notcher. I'm currently working on that video, so hit the subscribe button and bell so you don't miss it when it comes out. If you have access to a high quality tubing cutter large enough for an axle tube, you can increase the precision of your cut by first scoring the metal at your marks. The axle tube is nearly a quarter inch thick, so the tubing cutter won't cut it, but it'll give you a groove that your cutoff wheel will follow with ease. If you don't have a tubing cutter, grab some wide tape and make yourself a visual guide around the tube at your cut marks. I'd suggest marking which edge of the tape is the cut line so you don't mistakenly cut at the wrong edge of the tape. When cutting, rather than cutting directly on the edge of the tape, purposely cut away from the edge to create a margin for error. Your handheld cut will likely be uneven and this will ensure you don't cut too far and then perfect the edge with a flap disc. The more precise your cuts, the tighter your fitment will be, the less heat shrinkage you'll see, and the straighter the housing will be in the end. Let me take a moment to point out what this tube looks like inside right now. It's completely coated in steel fragments and abrasive dust. All this stuff is going to have to be cleaned out really well so it doesn't make its way into any of the bearings. We're going to use the seam inside the tube to make sure we're welding the ends on in the original position. Just mark the edge of the tube at the seam so that you can see it from the outside. If for whatever reason you want to reposition your brake calipers, like say to match or mirror the location of the front calipers, now's the time to do it. Caliper orientation isn't super crucial as long as the caliper bleeder screw is at the top and you can connect a parking brake cable. Bevel the ends of the tube that will be welded to ensure proper penetration. Slap the ends in the jig, position the clock marks, and clamp tightly into the jig. The tube will be forced into the valley of the cradle and therefore will be forced to match the straightness of the jig. I spent a lot of time measuring this axle as I welded, but I honestly think it was pointless. I chose to measure the distance between the machined edge of the plate at the end of the axle and the edge of the differential where the tube is pressed in. I don't think that told me anything. The tube could essentially contort three degrees, a visible bend. The measurement between those two points would not change at least not enough to be detected with a tape measure. So to advise you to skip the measurements feels wrong, but this jig will prevent any measurable movement. Perhaps a better method to monitor the movement of the end of the axle housing would be using a machinist's dial indicator, but I honestly cannot imagine how you would mount it. Once again, welding slow and even is key. I'm going to start by applying heavy tack welds directly across from one another. Allow them to cool and rotate and repeat. The axle only contacts the jig at two small points at any given time. You should be able to add several tack welds before they interfere with the axle laying flat in the jig. Once there's eight solid tack welds, I'll move up to one inch beads directly across from one another. These will certainly affect the ability for the axle housing to lay flat, but by now it should be rigid enough to no longer depend on the jig for straightness.
I just realized that I should have been welding both ends of the axle back on at the same time. Perhaps you've noticed in this video and in previous videos, I only show work being done on one part of the vehicle, even though that work may need to be repeated on the other side. I do that to save on production time and shorten the overall length of the video by eliminating repetition, but this time it got me in a pickle. If you remember, I was talking earlier about making sure the tube is completely free of bumps when we started. Now, I added some weld beads that are definitely going to hold up this end of the axle when I flip it over, and it's going to affect the welds on this side. So what I'm gonna do is carefully grind down the weld beads on this side, check them with a straight edge to make sure nothing's sticking up, and then move on to welding on the opposite side. Once welding is done, I'm going to grind the weld smooth. I think that will technically weaken the weld joints, which are already in the worst place possible, right where the load bearing link bars will be. But I intend to gusset the entire axle assembly, which we'll cover in a future episode. The Mustang axle housing is done for now, and I'm waiting on the axles that I sent to Dutchman Motorsports to be shortened. While I wait, I'm going to get to work on the Mighty Max axle. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss that one. And until then, my friends, keep moving forward.